Cool. Yeah, thanks for uh, doing this. This should All be right. fun. All right, so we've got Derek here. You wanna you go by Derek Crane or you go by the Sax Spy? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Derek Crane's my real name, obviously, but uh, Sax Spy would be my like my Instagram and social media profile. Okay. Yeah. But. I met actually Rulon with Keeleys at the NAMM convention, and he talked about you, and he's like, yeah, the sax spy talked to me. And he's like, who are you? And he's like, and you said, I'm the sax spy. <laughs> so how, how'd you come up with that yeah. name, actually? Uh, so funny story. Um, like, none of this was ever planned, like, to do Instagram at all. But uh, when I was, um, I was looking for a new horn, uh, probably a Selmer, which I ended up getting, that was about a year and a half ago, and when I uh, had to come up with a name, I already had my own account, and so I wanted one to just show saxophones, and I guess the alliteration is just what I ended up with, so okay. sax by. And that kind of led me to uh, just kind of try out everyone else's horns and find things, so I don't know, maybe the name made me <laughs> instead of uh, the other way around. Okay, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting name. Definitely, I remembered it. It's got like a sort of alliteration i've got I guess yeah i got kind of something similar with sax station <laughs> right yeah you live in salt lake city yeah so i okay. grew up in salt lake city uh, i went to bru uh, brigham young university in provo uh -huh. and i'll just be finishing up here in the fall but yeah i'm just living in salt lake right now okay and you're studying music like performance or you're gonna plan on teaching yeah so i started in performance Okay. And then I switched to the commercial music program, okay. um, which was pretty new at our school. And they had a track called Studio Performance. All right. And I've always wanted to do like session recordings and all that kind of stuff. So that really appealed to me. Um, and then near the end, I switched to jazz studies, um, mainly just to get me out a little bit sooner. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but still took all the, the core recording engineer classes and everything. And that's been super helpful. Okay. And what do you really want to do? You want to kind of write music and perform, or you want to? What's your? What's your yeah. Plan? So I actually have a twin, and okay. he's more into the composition. And so he's in LA right now as a, a composer. Interesting. And he must have gotten all the um, ability for that. But <laughs> right now I do uh, mostly uh, session work, a lot of remote recording, and okay. so people will just send me tracks. Um, and then I add to them. Like for this week, for example, this week I did some rap, did some EDM. Hmm. Last week I did J-pop. I did a traditional Japanese song. I did some bass flute. Hmm. I've done a lot of hook writing. So I, I guess that's a little bit of composition, but, you know, hook stuff for pop songs. Okay. Probably nothing you'd ever hear, but okay. it's still fun. That's interesting. I, I've got a kind of a random question. Are you guys fraternal twins or identical twins? We're identical. Identical. So theoretically, you should have <laughs> about the same potential for composing. <laughs> I don't know. Yep. I'm just kind so, of making that up. <laughs> well, I, I like your optimism. Maybe there's something that I could explore there. It, it doesn't <laughs> sound like you do like write some music. So yeah. okay, that's cool. Interesting. And how did you kind of get started with that? What was like one of your first projects? How did you kind of get going? Mm, first project. Uh, I... I did an ad for a genealogy um, website. I think it's genealogy.com, something like that. Okay. And they had a big band, and so they took us into the LDS Motion Picture Studio, and I played in a sax section there. Um, my teachers, uh, Ray Smith and Derek Bradford, are like the big woodwind uh, recording artists here in Salt Lake. And uh, Salt Lake's kind of funny because um, there's a lot of, like movie trailer recording here hmm. that's kind of thing so like they do marvel movie trailers and all kinds of things you know up north oh i don't know and that. so my yeah it's it's kind of funny it's a weird hub out in the middle of nowhere but mm -hmm. so they've been doing that and then they called me for one of those gigs and it's i just loved it and kind of done it ever since cool and you probably made some connections and kind of mm -hmm. expand on that nice and who do you say your teacher was uh his name is dr ray smith at Brigham Young University. Okay. He's um he did his I think doctorate or master something at Indiana University in five woodwinds. Okay. And so that's kind of where my multi woodwinds come from too. Oh yeah, I saw that picture you had like was it like twenty or thirty instruments? Yeah, something like I didn't even count. Yeah. You, you play all of them? 
Oh, absolutely. yeah. Those are the ones that I've been recording on um, and everything. So there was, let's see if I remember, the Baroque recorders. I had a set of Sopranino, Soprano, Alto, and Tenor. And I do need to get a bass. Um, there were the uh, Chinese whis- or Chinese flutes, mm-hmm. a couple different keys. The Korean flutes that I picked up when I was in Korea. Um, penny whistles. I do a lot of penny whistle stuff. Um, like uh, maybe two weeks ago, I did a tour in Wyoming and did some like, uh, I'd call it maybe Irish pop style stuff. Like to think um, like the Titanic theme. Okay. You know, a little bit of an, an Irish vibe on top of a pop song. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, it sounds um, like you kind of go in a lot of different directions. Yeah. So, but it's, it's but been a lot of fun. Your kind of main instrument is baritone saxophone? Or? Uh, so I just had that because I didn't have a very sax stand. Okay. So I had to hold it in the picture. Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought maybe uh, I was tell everyone. What you're focused I on. tell everyone my uh, main instrument is whatever's in my hands. Oh, okay. You know? Because uh, if I if I want to do all these flute and clarinet gigs, you know they're not going to hire me to be a doubler. They're going to hire me to be a you know a flute player or clarinetist. Yeah, yeah. That so makes sense. I've I've played clarinet the longest. Okay. Probably played the most ensembles on clarinet in college, but I did you know a few ensembles on every instrument. So I kind of got around to everything. Okay. How old were you when you started on clarinet? Uh, seventh grade. Okay. So the reason I started is uh, my church had a local jazz band, and I wanted to play saxophone with them. Mm-hmm. But you know, my middle school teacher made me play clarinet for a year. Okay. And then so I did that, and then the the day I got my saxophone, I remember coming home from the store. My parents were dropping into the grocery store on the way, and I sat out in the car, and just tried to learn all the fingerings. <laughs> and when I got home, I kept playing. It was like seven hours that first day, and. Oh, wow. Finally learned all the fingerings and oh, that's impressive. That you was the start. For seven hours on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say how good it was. But oh, I mean, it was a, it was I think a fun you're, start. You're probably having fun and experimenting though. I, I don't. I remember getting a clarinet. That, that's what I started on to when I was in sixth grade. But I, I don't remember exactly how long I played. That sounds like you have a very okay. vivid memory though. <laughs> oh well, I'm not exactly. Uh, like that. I don't know. But yeah. Also seven well, everything. Hours, which is, I don't think I played it that long the first day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, yeah, like soon after I, uh, I jumped in with the, the jazz band and we ended up doing a tour in California. Um, I can't remember where it was, but it was a lot of fun. So I played a couple of years with them. Nice. And do you travel very much or you kind of do more recording kind of in studios near where you live? Um, I probably travel mm-hmm. about once every one or two months. Okay. Um, so... I did two Wyoming trips. I did the the Celtic one, and then I played principal bassoon at it in an orchestra out in Wyoming um, a few weeks ago. I traveled to Boise. I played with the Boise Symphony, and that was for the. Um, it was actually a really cool gig uh, for jo- with Johnny Mathis. I don't know if you know his name. He's like an old uh, golden oldies singer. Oh, okay. But um, anyway, everyone's played in that uh, group. Like if you open it up, it's got like Gordon Goodwin. I mean, he did most of the arrangements, or at least a, a good number of them. Um, you can see like some of the big names. Greg uh, Yasininski, I think, is one. Um, but anyway, I took a picture of it. It's on my Instagram. It's got like all these L.A. players on there. Okay. So it's kind of cool that I got to pencil my name in on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Okay. And... With like all the instruments, you, so you started on clarinet, you kind of moved to saxophone. How did you kind of get in like bassoon and flute and all these things? They just kind of oh, good question. You along? So um, I started uh, lessons up with Ray in my sophomore year of high school. Mm-hmm. And that's when he really started pushing me to learn clarinet and flute uh, as a minimum. And so that's when I started. Um, <clears throat> like my senior year, I ended up, I was like principal clarinet of like the best of state orchestra and um like we did all kinds of shows um flute was happening then but i think flute kind of picked up more in college Um, bassoon i also started my senior year just dabbling in it Uh, my teacher gave me a lesson but that one really came around uh, two or three years ago in his woodwind workshop class 
Um, he does a two semester uh, class. The first semester is like clarinet and saxophone, so I didn't take that one. Mm-hmm. And the second one is flute, bassoon, and oboe. And so that's when I jumped in and I just, I, did, I practiced the oboe for about a year, but I just decided to stick with bassoon. Okay. Um, took lessons with the, the bassoon teacher at BYU. Okay. Um, jumped into the Philharmonic Orchestra, which is uh, what they consider like the flagship group. Um, that was a lot of fun. I did a couple of years in there doing bassoon, a uh, little second bassoon and contra bassoon. Okay. And then uh, I think the coolest show I played on bassoon was the end of December. I did the Zelda symphony. <laughs> and so that was really cool. It was actually the last show. Is that in Salt Lake uh, or where is it? Uh, so the Zelda symphony, it's like a, um, a touring group. Okay. And so they have like a few of the musicians tour and then the rest are, you know, local hires. And they just play music from, you know, the Legend of Zelda video game series. <laughs> and so I got to play with uh, basically the Utah Symphony. Um, but, you know, contracted out. But that's who the players were. So that was a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like be a cool show. <laughs> yeah. And then all the other little doubles came from lessons with my other teacher, uh, Darren Bradford. And, you know, we took two semesters just learning all the recorder fingerings, playing in recorder ensembles doing Penny Whistle and all the other kinds of stuff. So. Interesting. Yeah, it sounds like you, you do get hired for that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Penny, if you are looking to do recording, mm-hmm. um, I would totally pick up Penny Whistle and recorders. Um, I mean, with their price and the amount you get paid, they you know they pay for themselves really quickly. Oh, wow. I never even thought about doing that. Yeah. I mean, if you look, lots of the LA cats are playing on recorders. Um uh there's a site um it's run by geo washington wright he has a bunch i think it's um something to do with la studio musicians i'd have to look it up but he always gets pictures of all these recording sessions Mm -hmm. and you know everyone's there and they've got their saxes flutes and then recorders and so it's really cool yeah that's that's something new i'm learning today so those are pretty popular in like uh, like scores for movies and things, or what? yeah. Um, so let me see if I can remember. Uh, I think Secret Life of Pets is the one I'm thinking about, or Minions. One of those is one of those animated movies, mm-hmm. and they had a uh, contrabass recorder, which is the big one that looks like a square uh, okay. fence post. The keys are square, and so someone was playing that one, um, and. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I can't think of it off the top of my head, but, you know, that's kind of why I wanted to jump in and learn it. Oh, uh, Harry Potter, actually. Yeah. Um, Harry Potter uh, and the Prisoner of Azkaban, the third movie, and Window of Time, something like that's the track, I believe. Okay. That one's got the recorder solo on it. Oh, interesting. I'll have to go back and listen to that. Da, 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 da. And I can't sing it all, but yeah. go something like that. And that one was played by the like the recorder society there. It wasn't like a doubler or anything, but I like yeah. playing that one. Do you play like much piano or guitar or um, instruments or mostly like woodwinds? I tried. So I actually yeah. started on piano when I was four. Okay. Um, I played that for about four years, but it just wasn't ever my thing. All right. Like I did Suzuki, so I, I went through and got all the you know trophies, huh. kind of you know that they have you do. Yeah. Um. I tried guitar in middle school, mm-hmm. and actually, funny enough, I did uh, my senior year of high school. I did a guitar making uh, workshop oh. um, or a class for the whole year, and so we made a classical guitar. And I made mine out of paduke and tulip wood, which is like a bright orange kind of wood. Not doesn't look like a classical instrument at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, but sounds like fun. But yeah, I was never any good at guitar. Or any any instrument with like spatial awareness, I guess. Like piano, I'm moving too much. Guitar, you move too much. Yeah. Keep your hands. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, you gotta know where everything is all at once. Okay, interesting. Okay. And um, I want to ask you maybe about like how you practice and maybe how you structure your practice now. How you used to practice, maybe how it's changed over the years. Sure. So when I first started, I was playing. You know, seventh grade. I was probably playing half an hour to an hour a day. Uh, my second year, I, I started getting lessons with the local high school teacher. And he was really good. 
And he just challenged me to practice a ton. Okay. Um, he started me off on the Close uh, Daily Exercise book. Yeah. You know, the orange one. It used to be orange. It's gray now. Okay, yeah. And I didn't know that was usually like a college level book. And I'm not, you know, I, I probably uh, played it terribly, but um, he always challenged me to play them 16th notes at 120. I don't know if I ever got there, but that was always my goal. So I was always practicing, you know, by the by ninth grade, two or three hours every day, just okay. trying to get those etudes down. And we did jazz stuff too, but then in high school is probably when I practiced the most. Um, I played. Uh, before school, during lunch, and then after school to about 11 o'clock usually. Hmm. And then near the end, I was going to about 1 o'clock, and my parents got so frustrated. They <laughs> they called my private teacher, and they're like, what should we do? We can't get him to stop. My teacher tells us all the time he loves his stories. And then he called him back. He's like, don't make him stop. Like, let him keep practicing. <laughs> Soundproof a little area or something. <laughs> uh, I went out in the garage a few times. Okay. So. That's funny. Um, but yeah, and then uh, my freshman year of college was pretty intense. Um, that's when I picked up bass clarinet. Um, I was I did a, a tour group. I was like principal bass clarinetist for the tour, and I don't know why they put me there, and I had to learn it. And so I was doing bass clarinet for five hours every day, just trying to get all the fingerings down and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so those were about 14-hour days. Oh. Uh, it probably doesn't show a lot. I'm not like... <laughs> There's a bunch of amazing saxophonists out there. I think I've kind of spread everything out, you know, you know among all the different instruments. Yeah, um, it's like it kind of works for what you're doing and like a lot of recording projects. Yeah, exactly. And then so now, um, usually I'll just practice when I have a free moment, uh, which is great now that I'm out of school. It's I can get you know most of the afternoon in practice. Okay. Nights I'll go to the studio and do some recording. Um, sometimes I'll you know play a gig or two or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, with so many instruments, you have to kind of focus on a few at a time. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other ones you do maintenance practice. So, for example, like, I'm really pushing saxophone right now. Mm -hmm. And so I'll do, like, you know, all my technical exercises, everything my teacher has me do. And then my flute and clarinet will be a lot of tone exercises, keep those going. Uh -huh. um, you know, maybe the close scales <clears throat> for clarinet and, like, De La Sonorite warm-ups for flute and the uh, Taftel and Gaber, you know, some of those daily exercises for flute. Okay. Do, um, you, do you also, like, learn music by ear or transcribe stuff on saxophone? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. I, um, yeah. I mean, for jazz, you got to do that. You got to be able to play by ear. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of transcribing solos. I did Dexter Gordon, 3 o'clock in the morning this week. Uh, last week I was working on uh, Chi Chi by Parker, but it, on tenor, so a little bit like a fourth higher than you might normally play it. Mm -hmm. Kind of throws it off a little bit, but it's fun to learn. Yeah. Um, I really liked uh, Coltrane in high school. I transcribed a lot of his solos. Okay. Um, but yeah, but then that ear training kind of goes along into recording, because oftentimes they'll send me a, like a riff or you know, a melody and that's all I get is they just send me a track and the melody in, played by a MIDI instrument and I have to recreate it. Hmm. And so the faster I can do that, the you know more efficient uh, my time is. Okay, interesting. Um, so that's a lot of fun. It, it's a good skill. Uh, there's guys around here that are that have way insane hearing and nothing special, but you can always work at it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you said you used to listen to a lot of Coltrane. Uh, who do you listen mm -hmm. to these days? Any... Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to, uh, I like finding um, like new players that maybe aren't as big mm -hmm. um, and listening to them. Like, for example, uh, I posted a new one of the new records I got. Um, I don't remember his name. Uh, well, I feel dumb bringing it up now. That I can't remember his name. It's, uh, it's the red one. But I've listened to that one. That's kind of like a classical album. It's called Hybrid. It's got a lot of good stuff. Okay. Um, I, I've always liked Chris Potter. I mean, he's a bigger guy. Yeah. Will Vinson. Um, I'm trying to get back into Joshua Redman. I mean, he's a big guy too. Yeah. Uh, I listened to him in high school, and then I kind of put him off because I thought he wasn't intellectual enough. 
and now that I've gone back, it's like, no, I was totally wrong. Like, yeah. <laughs> this stuff's great. <laughs> you know, you have those phases where it's uh, like, you, I mean, going out of high school, you think you know everything. or and I mean, and you're, you, you don't necessarily connect with everything that someone records either. Maybe you heard some stuff you like more or some stuff you not, don't quite feel as close to. So Right, exactly, yeah. I mean, there's so much out there. Right now, I'm really trying to find guys uh, – whose tone is really good in like the left upper left hand range. Mm-hmm. Um, Ed Kayo told me to go back and listen to Coltrane for that. Okay. Um, Cause that's kind of a weakness right now. And so whenever I listen to people, like that's what I'm trying to find is like, Oh, is that a good example of, you know what I should sound like? I mean, as, aside from just like enjoying it, like when I'm trying to study what they sound like, you know? Okay. Okay, and also you have kind of a business where you make like end plugs, custom end plugs oh, yeah. out of different types of wood. It kind of, kind of makes me think of that guitar that you made with the. Yeah. yeah. So I've always kind of had like a little bit of a, a wood shop inside me. Like, okay. uh, in elementary school, my best friend's dad was like a carpenter, and so we were always outside like trying to build tree houses, and we'd have like we had toy wooden guns and slingshots and spears and all kinds of things that we had made and right. worked on, but. Yeah, so I just kind of came back because my father-in-law uh, does wood turning, and maybe eight months ago I wanted to make you know some of those cool end plugs, and I thought it'd be easy, but no, <laughs> <laughs> took a lot of practice. I screwed up so many of them, but now I'm pretty good at them. I think I have some right here. Okay. Um, these ones I have to put the cork on. Let's see if I can show you that. So this is the tiger That's wood. Pretty, Everyone loves uh, tiger wood. And then here's like a tenor version. Okay. How did you get the idea to start making this? Did someone ask you for one, or you just thought it'd be? Uh, I just I just wanted one. I mean, I thought my plastic one was kind of stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and okay. I mean, I'd seen like the this was halfway through doing the sax by, so I'd seen some of the vintage, you know, Selmer plugs, and I thought those were so cool. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, like the the ones made out of the uh, Grenadilla, and so. Okay, that's that's like the same wood that clarinets are made out of a lot of times. Right? Yeah, some clarinets. Yeah, I think some others are ebony, but yeah, yeah. it's actually uh, there's a new thing that just came out with Cocobolo and Grenadilla, like those families of woods with exporting and stuff. It makes it a little bit harder to oh, okay, work with, but huh. yeah, yeah, I've seen a I've seen some pictures. Those look pretty cool. I might I might have to try and get one sometime. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can make you one. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And yeah, like, yeah, I've, like, uh, kind of how I first saw you is like through your Instagram. And then um, you basically, people send you a bunch of photos of their saxophones. And I think saxophone players just like to check it out. It's kind of like going to a, a toy shop for us, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, they do send me stuff, but usually I'm I'm bugging people to send me pictures, you know? Oh, okay. Like, uh, they, don't, they only let me follow 7,500 people on Instagram. And so I'm trying to cut down, you know, who I follow, but there's so many cool saxophones out there and, <laughs> you know, cool setups that yeah. I just, you know, like finding them and then finding the story of, you know, how they got the saxophone and, uh, and all that, finding their setup. Like when I first uh, started, yeah. I was posting all the saxophones that I tried here in Utah and Utah is like a big cannonball place. Okay. Um, I mean, cannonballs are great instruments. Uh, they have a factory you know, maybe 10 minutes uh, away from my house right here. And, you know, my teachers are, you know, the ones who are, you know, building them, designing them and everything. So I've seen so many prototypes. Uh, I've gotten to go in the factory and look at all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, they're always trying everything. They're so cool there. Um, Lots of uh, of innovation going on. But anyway, so uh, back to my point, I was saying, uh, so a lot of people play cannonball here in Utah. And so I was trying to seek out all like, the, the older guys who were playing Mark Sixes and SBAs and all that kind of stuff. And so most of my early posts are just me, you know, finding those cool horns and, and all that. And that's what I still try and do. There's, I've got a list of probably like 30 different horns that I still need to go find and look at and, you know, post about. But, okay. I mean, I always just wonder, there, you know, there are 80-something thousand Mark Six tenors you know, for example, you know, most of them are probably surviving, like, where are they at? 
But yeah, so I'll just bug people, and I usually bug them for a couple of weeks until they finally have time to send me something. <laughs> and... Yeah, I remember but... you asked about my soprano. I guess you probably just saw me play my soprano in some video, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah was that the con soprano? Yeah, yeah, I got it right here, actually. Yeah, let's see that one. That Yeah. yeah this guy. So, there you go. Kind of yeah, you don't see those too often. Yeah, I think it's from like, I'd say 1919 or? No, no, 1929. Yeah. 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 Same year wow. my grandpa was born. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I just geek out about all that kind of stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a cool but... horn. Yeah, this one, like, I didn't have a soprano, uh, but I kind of was thinking about getting one. And then I, I ran into uh, Justin Clunk. I kind of met him through Brian Landau, like Brian's thing at the NAM. And he was telling me okay. maybe sometimes you can find, like, a con soprano for, like, a pretty good price. So I, I got on eBay. I came from, I think, Wisconsin. And it didn't come with a cool. case. It came just, like, in a big box with a bunch of packing material. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> and then I had to had to replace like five pads. I put I put some pieces of cork on myself. Did a few like little repairs, but it plays pretty well. So yeah, that's way cool. Yeah, they make instruments are so cool. They just last too. Yeah. Do you ever do any like repairs on your sac or your instruments in general? Because you got you got the whole um. I thought about it. I haven't dedicated a whole lot of time. Okay. You know, I I'm pretty good at doing. I can manage all the adjustment screws and everything just fine. Mm -hmm. um, I can I do all the neck recorking and everything because, I mean, like for these plugs, this is a clarinet tenon style of corking, right? So okay. it's got like the overlap and, you know, you can't really see the seam. And if this were put in like a clarinet, it would be airtight kind of thing. Right. And so saxophone, you know, there's some differences, but just doing all these all the time, I felt comfortable doing that on my saxophones. So, okay, and you also teach a little bit. Yeah, so I have a, a private lesson studio. I teach, you know, Saturdays, like, you know, eight to four or something. Okay. And I'm trying to do weekdays now that I'm, you know, more out of school and kids are, you know, out of school as well. Hmm. But I have flute students, I have saxophone students, bassoon students, and sometimes like they don't even know I play the other instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, because I always bring the, that one that instrument to the lesson, and then, you know, they'll find out when I'm, you know, playing flute in their bassoon lesson or, you know, bassoon in their saxophone lesson. They're like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, oh, I just, I just want to practice one right now, you know. Let's do our scales kind of thing. Okay, interesting. How long have you been teaching for? Um, I've been teaching since uh, junior year of high school. Okay, so a little And while. so... So that's 17, maybe nine, eight or nine years now. Right. Well, I guess if you don't, two years off, so maybe seven years. Okay. Anything you've kind of like learned in your years of teaching? Um, it is very hard to motivate students. <laughs> I don't know. I can't say I'm a great teacher, but all the great teachers who can motivate their students, you know, I appreciate them a lot. Okay. Um, I think uh, the students that play in ensembles at school usually... Uh, learn faster and practice a little bit more. Okay. Um, and then students that ask their own questions or come prepared with their own questions usually learn the most and, you know, uh, develop their talents the most, I would say. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very true. So, you know, really trying to get those students to be inquisitive and, you know, bring questions in is like really what I'm trying to, you know, do. Yeah, that makes it kind of more interesting for you too, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, my mom, uh, my mom um, taught me early on to always carry a notebook with me. Okay. And so to all my lessons, I'd always take my own notes. I wouldn't have the teacher take my notes. Yeah. Uh, I have mine right here. All right. Um, I have, you know, probably thirty or forty different moleskin notebooks just filled up with lessons. Oh wow. And so you know, lessons that I walk around, write down my thoughts, you know different exercises and so now i can go back and see you know every lesson i've ever had yeah. i can see you know what i was working on and you know my perspective at the time and that really helps with teaching too to okay. kind of try and think from you know what i was like at that age Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I pretty much take notes i think for most of the lessons i've ever been to so, yeah yeah i find it helpful yeah I'd, I'd highly recommend anyone do that, you yeah, know, if yeah. you're taking lessons. One of my teachers kind of laughed. He's like, you're the only one who does that. And I was like, well, <laughs> it helps me. <laughs> I record it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. And what I'm trying to do is uh, I I have recordings <clears throat> probably from high school on. Mm -hmm. 
I had like a little pocket recorder. Yeah. And uh, I'm just trying to get the recordings and then scan, you know, a PDF of the lesson and put that all together and digitize it. Okay. But I think that, uh, I mean, that'd be cool that once I get that all finished to just have everything together. Do you have any uh, new projects you're working on? Hmm. I have a few. Let's see. So I really like how the Key Leaves Challenge is going on right now. Okay. Um, which is on my Instagram page, which is oh, yeah, uh, just, fine. you know, approaching different people, getting them to try, you know, the product. It's not sponsored. It's just, you know, I liked it. And then Key Leaves is like, hey, like, give us an idea and you know real so cool he's full of yeah, ideas too cool he probably brother. thought of most of it but we uh we sent out you know the the key leaves to everyone and i think that's really cool is just trying to get back to um like some critical analysis and like analyzing all these different projects like from a bunch of different perspectives mm-hmm. and so uh, like new projects um I'm working on one that I probably can't talk about yet in detail, okay. but it's going to be, you know, a certain product done a certain way. Um, not by, not by any one company. It's going to be some things that I find. Okay. And then I just send all those different styles to one person, see what they think and send them around and just kind of, you know, build the, the opinion and the, you know, the knowledge of the saxophone community that way. Oh, I don't know if that's the kind of project you're talking about. Oh, yeah, that's definitely <laughs> what, what could have been included in that one uh kind of a scientific approach almost yeah yeah exactly that's kind of the reasoning behind that one Mm -hmm. um another project is i'm working on recording an arrangement my brother did of the new han solo theme um i think the movie just premiered today or yesterday or a few days i haven't seen it yet yeah friday or something last week yeah something like that Yeah. yeah anyway so that one um that one will be a lot of fun playing all the, you know, woodwind instruments on that. Okay. Um, I have a big band and like a year ago we'd been, we were playing for a while. We were doing a lot of different dances. My brother would, you know, make arrangements for that. We okay. did uh La La Land, you know, a couple of those tunes for big band that he wrote or I guess arranged. And those were really cool. All right. um, so I might pick that back up. But, Is, like swing dancing like pretty popular around? yeah okay uh yeah utah has a, a big swing dancing scene it's kind of funny some of it's like the more country swing i guess they might call it mm-hmm. but they do enjoy like lindy hop too there's some different circles but we try and play to the lindy hop and like east coast swing crowds okay yeah i started to learn how to dance that a little bit a little while back but uh kind of got more into salsa i play in a salsa band so Oh, very cool. I think that's a little more popular maybe in this area. Right. But, yeah, definitely used to kind of play more swing music in school and everything. So that's kind yeah. of, I think, what a lot of people start on. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you have some recordings that you've done that are available? Um, Not okay. of the big band. Okay. I have, I'm, I'm working on my portfolio right now, trying to get all my, um, like, remote recording stuff together. Probably, you know, just the ones that I like. Um, I think I, I recorded for some films that my brother did. Okay. Uh, he never really tells me what they are. I usually don't know what anything is. Like, <laughs> uh, for example, um, I got sent this music in a click track. It was for like bassoon, flute, and clarinet. Mm-hmm. And so I recorded it, sent it back. Maybe a week later, I got the full mix, and it was a death metal album. All right. And so, like the uh, like the softer orchestral interlude parts between like the <laughs> uh, big guitars is where they had my stuff. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun to hear that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I probably should get my recordings more out there. Okay, and uh, if people want to check out what you're doing, is maybe they should go to your Instagram first. Uh, you have a, a website that they should check it out, or where do you where do you kind of talk to people? Yeah, first? I would uh, I would check out my Instagram first. Uh, at the dot sax dot spy okay. and uh, I'm working on my website right now it's um, I had a website before but it was kind of like a WordPress site 
Okay. Didn't look too good. And then I switched and it deleted all the information. And so now it's just like some generic stuff I haven't filled in yet. So it's like Derek Crane and then it's like something about <laughs> some guy or something. I don't know. Okay, yeah. It's not me. I think, but, uh, are you still using WordPress or are you switched to a different, like, CMS? I'm I'm switching right now. I'm thinking of doing, you know, Squarespace or something more visually based. So okay. I don't have to worry about all that. Yeah, I mean, WordPress, you definitely can do a lot, but it takes a little more, like, knowledge of the code to customize yeah. it. Yeah. So. And uh, I'm not very good at that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I but yeah. some about it, but I also I'll hire people sometimes. So. Okay, yeah. so. so a lot of people do ask about where they can see like my end plugs and stuff too. Mm -hmm. And those are on my secondary account, oh, yeah. I, I which is, uh, yeah. At sex by dot declassifieds. Okay. Which yeah. I still think is like the funniest pun. I don't know. Maybe it's a dad joke instead of classifieds. It's declassifieds, you know, spy. <laughs> it's a, oh, it's a okay. dumb pun. Yeah. I think I saw it, but I never <laughs> thought about it too much. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, but, Okay, and yeah. then is that linked to from your main Instagram though, right? Yeah, it should just be in the profile. Okay, so you just follow right it there. Go to the main Instagram, then go there. Do you do very much on YouTube or not so much more on Instagram? Um, point? I'm trying to get into YouTube. Um, I think okay. that would be really cool. Right. Uh, you know, one thing at a time, but okay. we'll get there. Okay, so probably start by checking out your Instagram then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, so basically, like, I've been running Sack Station for a little while. It's my website. I just, I started when I was in college, and I just kind of posted stuff about what I was learning, and just, I posted videos that I thought were cool, like something from Stanley Turrentine or Brecker or something like that, and then it kind of evolved. I started doing more videos, and then I'm trying to do more on YouTube at this point. Cool. So, yeah, I was checking out a little bit before I, I jumped in. You're doing, like, a bunch of different songs. Yeah. I see there's a lot of, like, consistent branding and everything. That's really cool. Yeah, and then I started to draw maybe, I think I started to draw in like 2012, so yeah, about six years at this point, so I try and throw in drawings to try and make it. Yeah, and they just like kind of play as your videos going through. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, basically I, I draw them That's on like, cool. a, like a tablet, and like it records like each stroke I do, even when I make complete mistakes, so you see all <laughs> the, <laughs> the kind of raw, raw footage of me drawing, but you, you see how I correct it, I feel like kind of the process of like learning to draw or like learning a language or learning music, they're all really similar to each other, any skill. Right. So, yeah. Which is kind of funny. I don't know. I think I mentioned to you this in, uh, in passing in one of our conversations, like, uh, the two year break I took. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You said you um, went to Portugal, right? Yeah. So I was in Portugal serving like a church mission. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's kind of when my music went on hold, hmm. but I, I kind of switched it for language learning. Okay. And so a lot of those skills learned in music, I could just put right into, yeah, yeah. you know, learning a language. So I I still carried around my notebook. I I recorded okay. sometimes, you know, people on the street, okay. and then I'd go home and transcribe it, and then practice like okay. talking along with it. It's like playing the jazz, you know, learning a second yeah, yeah, language. Definitely. Can you can you say something in Portuguese for us? Um, what's something real? Uh, real I'm not Portuguese. Other people might. Oh, I know, I know, <laughs> but. Someone out uh, there's a lot of Brazilian followers of mine. Okay. I speak a very different Portuguese than theirs, so let me think of something. Um, I don't know if any cool phrases, but you can the way you say cool in Portuguese is fish. Fish, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, went to, uh, I went to Germany actually when I was in college, and they, it's like the one thing I learned from some Portuguese yeah. girls who were there. Who, they were learning German yeah. too. And then I guess in yeah. Brazil you say like que legal. I mean, it's like this. Yeah, exactly, thing. yeah. <laughs> you could, yeah, here we'd say like Bue de Fish. Okay. Bue is like the African kind of influence there. It's it's like a slang word for like very like uh, Bue de Fish meu, or something. <laughs> they just speak really low. It's kind of fun. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. And do you still speak in Portuguese sometimes or it's been a little while since then? Uh, I try to. I certainly understand it. Um, my, I guess what we call our dads. Uh, which is what we call our trainers there. He lives here in Utah now. Okay. And he was born in Angola. And so I try and talk to him every once in a while. Um, keep it up. You know, so I'll read my, uh, I'll read stuff in Portuguese. I grabbed this book to show you. This is one I picked up when I was there. All right. You can see it's, I had it uh, silver and engraved and everything, got my name on it and everything. Oh, nice. That's pretty. But, 
So I try and, I try and read whenever I can. Sometimes I go back to grammar books and stuff, but it's it's always tough, you know. But I should get back into that. Okay. Do you speak any other languages or like English or um, Portuguese or? Yeah, English, Portuguese. I understand Spanish because my brother went to Paraguay. And so he'd always speak to me in Spanish and I'd speak to him in Portuguese and we'd just, you know, learn a little that way. Oh, um, I did a little bit of um, Creole from Guinea when I was I, there. I think you mentioned that. Uh, I was living in an area um, called Bahairu, which is like the in the middle of Lisbon, maybe southern Lisbon. And there's like this big African population there that we were helping. Okay. And so, you know, they understood Portuguese and everything, but, you know, if I approached them and I was speaking Creole, you know, they'd think that was so cool. They're like, they'd tell me, you're so white on the outside, but your heart is black. <laughs> you know, something like that. that sounds, it usually has like their African accent. But yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. All right. And did you play some music when you were there too? Or you were mostly um, the only music I played was, were hymns in church. And I, so that... I, that's where all my piano playing went. I could manage playing, you know, two hand piano. As soon as I got back, it's like it disappeared. It's like not there anymore. It's like, you don't need it. It's gone. <laughs> okay, that's funny. So. okay. Yeah. 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 I've seen like, I, I kind of like enjoy learning languages myself. And I've seen like Victor Wooden talk about how like language and music are all kind of the same. Process. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, with that Creole dialect, there was it's not a written language. Mm -hmm. And so it was just all by ear and listening to a lot of people. I mean, that's the one I felt most comfortable with. I could, you know, make all the conjugations and had pretty good vocabulary. But we, you know, we'd learn phrases in, you know, uh, some of the different tribal languages from Angola or Mozambique, you know, the different friends we'd make, meet, we'd, you know, have them teach us stuff and we'd you know, just substitute that in whenever we talk to them. Cool. That sounds interesting. But, yeah, it's just, yeah, a lot of influences from what you hear, the people you're with, it's just like music mm -hmm. um, in that way. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, well, it's been good talking to you. I guess I know a little more about your background, I know who the sax spy is, I know why the yeah. part is declassified. <laughs> <laughs> I, should have, I should actually have a saxophone in my video. Oh, okay, and it looks like you got your key lives in there. <laughs> yeah, it's because uh, I, I had I was practicing, but then I you know still don't want to get it sticky. But okay. yeah, so this is the one I picked up in February. All right. Uh, you'll have to sit through this. I'll, I'll show this to you. All right. But this is an eighty thousand Mark Six. Found it in a closet in Texas. Huh. And I didn't want them to ship it, so I flew out. I flew five hours in because that's all I could afford was the, you know, really terrible flights. Yeah. You know, five hours in, met me at the airport, and then five hours back. How did you hear about it? So it was a whole day. Um, I think this one was through a friend, a trumpet player. Okay. Who had a friend in Texas who was, and this friend's dad passed away, and he was the only owner of the horn. Hmm. And anyway, so I got caught talking to him. And we worked out a really good deal, and that you know, was pretty cool. So, nice. it's the only Mark Six I've ever played where the middle D is not sharp; it's in tune. Okay, nice. Which is really strange. Like, I want to go and measure it and kind of figure out what's going on. Okay. Do you, Do you think uh, that's true for like altos and tenors you played, or? Um, yeah, I mean, usually the D's, you know, pretty sharp on most Selmers. Okay. Um, some more than others, but uh, this one's pretty right in tune. Good you found it. Sounds like you like the horn. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I, I think I remember uh, like a while ago we were talking about key leaves, and I think I had tried them like a little bit before you did, right? Uh, probably, like, yeah. Sounds like I mean, you became like what I kind of called a key lever. You like them, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You're the one that came up. Yeah, key lever. There we go. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I, I think Rulon likes it too, but I'm not sure yeah. if he's using it a bunch. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I love them. They, uh, it worked great. Right. And have you been to the NAM convention? Or are you planning to go? Uh, I'm starting to, now that I'm more out of school. I'm I'm planning on going. I want to hit the summer NAM show, okay, and the NAM show, and then you know NASA when that comes around. You know all those big shows. I want to start going to and you know seeing what's up. Yeah, yeah. I think they're they kind of fun to like try out the horns and just like meet all the different people they go to. But, yeah, the last big one I went to was Jen. Yeah, 
in okay. January. What was that like? I, I've heard about it, but I've never been to it. Yeah, so it was like Jazz Educators Network. And so I went there with my school's big band. Okay. And so we, we had a performance and, you know, everyone else has performances. A bunch of clinics every day, you know, music industry, music business, you know, saxophone, improv. They covered everything. And then they had big the big concert with the North Texas um, group. Chris mm -hmm. Potter was there, right. and um, Rich Perry was there. Uh, Rick Margitza was there. Kirk Whalem. What, oh, one of the cool things is we were on the uh, trade floor, flow, the trade show floor, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and uh, there's this big jam session. It was between. Um, Kirk Whalem, Bob Shepard had just showed up. Mm -hmm. um, not Ed Kaye, but uh, Ernie Watts mm -hmm. and Ben Britton and uh, a few other guys. There was just like this big circle of like all these legends playing together, and that was a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I'll see it at the NAMM convention. I, I kind of want to try and make it to some of these other events too. But yeah, gonna, hopefully uh, we can meet sometime. Cool, yeah, sounds good. All right, well, thanks for taking the time, and then I'll work on this. So I'll get it up on YouTube, and people can check it out. Cool, thank you so much.